It's seven o'clock, Your Worship. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. I'll bring this regular council meeting to order on Monday, December the 6th, 2021. And to acknowledge that we are on a traditional territory of Stahelis, the next order of business, please. The next order of business is the introduction of late items. And I would uh, draw the mayor's attention to the late item being the verbal report of the CAO regarding the award of an urban forest master plan contract uh, as a report out from the earlier in-camera meeting. If that could be added to the agenda, please. Well, not on the new business? Uh, reports from staff, it would be item 12C. Reports from staff, okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, moving on, the next item would be the approval of the agenda as amended. Moved by Councillor Piper, second by Councillor Vidal. Call the question, all in favor? Pass, thank you. Next order, please. The next order of business is the adoption of council minutes uh, that the regular council meeting minutes of November 1st, 2021 be adopted. Here for adoption, moved by Councillor Palmer, second by Councillor Piper. Any errors or omissions? I do have one on page three. Page three. That should, under the mayor's report, the fourth bullet, that should be Dave Sidhu. Dave Sidhu. Duly noted, your worship will make that correction. Thank you. Uh, any others from anybody? No? Call, call the question. All in favor? Thank you. Next order of business. The next order of business, your worship, is any business arising from the minutes? Any business from councillors arising from the minutes? Being none, we move on, please. Uh, there's nothing on the consent and uh, agenda, so we'll move right on to number seven, delegations and petitions. And the first delegation we have this evening is um, Attila Hertel from the IBI Group, who's here to talk about the parking master plan. Hello, Attila. Yes, hi, so I was waiting for the prop to, uh, to unmute and uh, start the, the video as well. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Can you please uh, confirm when you can see the, the presentation? Yes, thank you. Great, thank you. So my name is Attila Hertel. I'm a transportation engineer with IBI Group. With me is uh, Jenna Sheng. She's the technical lead on the study. Uh, she's the one that's uh, been along for the ride the entire time. She's done a lot of the analysis and uh, is, will be pre I'm presenting uh, along with myself today. Uh, so I'm just gonna jump right into it. Uh, the, I do wanna start off by noting that these are the preliminary study findings that we're gonna be discussing today. The, the uh, comments that we hear from you today, along with the comments that we've received from the public and from the village staff already, will be used to finalize the study findings, and then we'll be back in January to discuss those again. Uh, so I'll start right off uh, into the presentation. We'll be discussing the study introduction. We'll be discussing parking supply and demand, both existing and future conditions. We're going to look at uh, some of the changes that we're proposing to the on-street parking regulations. We're going to be looking at some additional considerations such as accessible parking, uh, electric vehicle parking, and parking wayfinding. We're going to be discussing the findings of the public and stakeholder consultation. And then we'll, we'll wrap up with uh, the next steps and then open the floor to questions and, and answers. Starting off with the study introduction. Uh, the purpose of the study is to improve the Harrison Hot Springs parking operations. Uh, as well as balancing the needs of uh, all different parking users. And this includes the local residents, uh, the businesses and visitors, which uh, includes tourists and uh, day trippers from the, the broader Fraser Valley area. Key objectives of the, of the study are to address public and stakeholder concerns, uh, identify existing parking constraints and project future parking demand. Uh, we'll be looking at optimizing parking regulations and uh, as well as looking at those additional considerations that I mentioned. Uh, at this point, I'll pass it over to Janice, who will talk to you about the existing and future parking supply and demand. Thanks, Attila. Uh, to perform parking utilization analysis, we conducted two full day surveys to collect parking supply and demand data. This slide shows the peak hour demand in the existing condition. The waterfront area was at 99% full with several on-street parking facilities overutilized. The residential area has no operational issues observed. Next slide, please. Uh, 
We projected future parking operations for 300 years. This slide presents the projected demand in 2046, which is expected to be the worst case scenario. The peak waterfront utilization will reach 175%, which means an additional 590 spaces will be required to reach the ideal 90% utilization. We also want to note that parking demand increased during COVID due to the increased number of day trippers. If parking demand returns to pre-COVID conditions, only 350 additional spaces will be needed. Next slide, please. While planning for future operations, there are a few constraints that we have identified. First is that the village does not own a vacant land near waterfront for a new parking structure, and new land procurement will likely not be benefit, uh, financially feasible. Also, from public complaints, we know that parking spillover into residential area is not desirable. In addition, remote off-street parking is not appealing because of the distance between possible parking facility and the waterfront. Given the projected number of parking spaces required and the limited available space, the village is anticipated to be faced with difficult decisions where, where all the constraints may not be met. This slide here shows short-term and long-term recommendations aimed at meeting future demand. For short-term, the village can explore opportunities for shared parking agreements with private waterfront establishments to make use of existing facilities and the difference in time of day peaks. The village can also encourage more active modes of transportation by expanding the transit and cycling network between the village and other district of Kent communities and improve pedestrian walking experience and safety within the village. As for long-term strategies, the village can request new developments to include additional spaces dedicated for public parking. The village should also closely monitor parking operations by regularly collecting parking demand data. With these recommendations in place, if future demand starts to exceed projected numbers, the village should consider having a new standalone parking structure as an ultimate solution. Now I pass it back to Attila. Great, thank you, Janice. Um, I'll be speaking to you about the on-street parking regulation changes. Uh, there's a few different items that we looked at. The first one is the pay parking expansion. Uh, so when, when considering where pay parking is typically appropriate, uh, it's in, in non-residential areas, along with locations that are typically experiencing high parking utilization. And when we compared the two, we noted that uh, there were three streets that, uh, that experienced high utilization and had uh, predominantly non-residential land uses. These were um, Lillooet Avenue, Cedar and Maple. And so we're recommending that the pay parking be implemented along these streets. Uh, boat launch parking, uh, that was the number one uh, feedback that we, that we received throughout the public and stakeholder engagement process was that uh, the boat launch parking supply is not sufficient to meet the boat launch parking demand. So we looked at a few different options. Uh, the first and uh, uh, the short term recommendation is to harm harmonize parking prices with general parking. And the intent here is to dissuade um, illegal non or non boat launch users from using the, the boat launch and that'll increase the availability to the intended users. Uh, we looked at a few different re reconfiguration options. Uh, by, by that I mean reconfigure, reconfiguring on-street parking along the streets near the boat launch area. Uh, but we ruled out those as, as potential solutions just because the, as Janice had noted, the, the general parking system was also operating at capacity. So we didn't want to take away parking space from general parking users. So the solution that we're recommending in the long term is to increase the boat launch parking supply off-street and with the parking demand met off street, we can reconfigure some of the uh, bow launch spaces along, on, along uh, Esplanade to general parking, thereby increasing the parking supply for general as well. The next item we looked at is one-sided street restrictions. Uh, the intent here is to uh, restrict parking along residential streets to just one side. Um, and the, the criteria that we came up when, with uh, when considering appropriate streets was um, the utilization had to be low. So we didn't want to create any parking capacity constraints by restricting parking. Uh, there had to be, or not had to be, but uh, ideally no, no, no sidewalks. And the idea here is that by restricting parking to one side, we minimize the, con uh, the conflicts between pedestrians and on-street parking users, and uh, also the uh, streets with, uh, with narrow road right of way. And this is this allows um, there, there would be difficulty with uh, vehicles parking on each side of the street. Uh, we want to limit it to one side to provide more space for for through vehicles. Uh, 
we have a comprehensive list in the report itself, but a few of the examples are Pine, McCombs, uh, Alder, and uh, Schooner. We also looked at uh, restricting parking uh, to a maximum of three to four hours for the parking system, the, the Austri parking system near the, the uh, waterfront and the residential areas. And the intent here is to limit uh, the visitors, the visitor parking demand from spilling into the residential neighborhoods. Uh, to allow the residents to continue parking as they do today, we're also recommending a residential parking permit program. And this would grant the holder, the permit holders exemptions to the, the aforementioned three to four hour uh, parking uh, restrictions. Uh, I do want to note that this, uh, the parking permit would not provide exemptions to the maximum 48 hour limit that's, that's currently in place. Uh, the intent here is just to restrict visitors from spilling into the the residential areas and to allow the residents to continue parking as they do today. And uh, based on public feedback, uh, we're also recommending that the village implement three to five uh, short term uh, 15 minute parking spaces in, uh, in zone one. That's the, the area uh, along the Esplanade and Lillooet, um, the, the western portion of it. I'll pass it back to Janice at this point for additional considerations. Um, the existing wayfinding technology here at the village includes static signs directing to boat launch lot, some on-site markings for special parking, and an online wayfinding map with different pay parking zones. The traditional way of improving parking wayfinding is to incorporate four layers of static signage as well as dynamic wayfinding signs. Uh, unfortunately, both strategies are not appropriate for the village because those systems are more suitable for large off-street parking facilities. What we do recommend the village to do is to update their online map to clearly identify supply at each facility and show the locations of special use parking spaces, similar to the map shown here. Next slide, please. Um, here are some additional best practices considerations and recommendations. Um, currently, cycling demand at the village is low and bike parking facilities are underutilized. Therefore, the village is recommended to maintain the existing supply and monitor future demand to address supply accordingly. Since e-bikes are very rarely seen here in North America, the current demand does not justify for installing dedicated e-bike charging stations at the village. For EV parking, the village is recommended to implement new charging stations that have users to pay for electricity. Since replacing the charging stalls will take time, in the short term, the village can work with, the, with um, precise parking to increase parking price for charging station users in order to cover the additional electricity cost. Future EV space demand is estimated based on the EV new sales rate outlined in the BC Zero Emission Vehicle Act. Since EV new sales rate in BC increases very rapidly, the village should also monitor future demand and provide additional stations if needed. Next slide, please. Uh, for public education, we saw that the, pub, uh, the public engagement rate is very high, which shows that the existing practices are effective. After the parking system map and parking strategies are updated, it is recommended for the village to notify the public through different modes of transportation, uh, sorry, different modes of communication. Uh, for accessible parking, we identified that the existing supply number is sufficient. The overall peak utilization was at 53%. There were several survey responses requested for more accessible parking along Esplanade, especially closer to Randall Park. Therefore, we recommend the village to relocate one accessible space from La Lua Road to near Randall Park. Next slide, please. I'll pass it back to Attila. Great, thanks, Janice. And we are nearing the completion of the presentation. Uh, typically, when we're designing the a parking system for municipality, we'd want to uh, accommodate the 90th percentile annual parking demand, and this allows the vast majority of the days or parking demand to be met, uh, but all but the, the peak, the annual peaks. And the reason why we wouldn't design it to the accommodate the annual peak is because the parking system would remain underutilized throughout the rest of the year. Uh, in Harrison Hot Springs, these annual peaks represent special events during summer week weekends. Uh, for example, the Dragon Boat Party, a Sasquatch Days, uh, Bands on the Beach in Canada Day. And during these times, we see some localized short-term parking demand spikes. And the ideal way to uh, approach uh, meeting this demand is to implement strategies that are alternative to a parking supply expansion. So we came up with a few different recommendations for Harrison Hot Springs. 
the first one is to increase parking prices during special events. Uh, the intent here is to manage parking demand as parking as the cost of driving and parking to a special event increases alternative modes of transportation would become more appealing and could encourage some users to adopt a, a different mode of transportation. Uh, we're also recommending alongside those parking uh, parking price increases that uh, Fraser Valley Transit Service be improved to encourage um, to encourage attendees coming from outside of Harrison Hot Springs to take transit, along with uh, encouraging the local residents to either walk or cycle. Uh, and potentially the most uh, effective solution would be to event uh, would be to encourage the event organizers to establish shared parking agreements with uh, some of the, the, the local developments, such as uh, the, the farms on the outskirts of Harrison Hot Springs, and to provide a shuttle bus service between the, the remote parking facility and the event itself. Uh, I do want to note that these could also be with, uh, with community centers outside of Harrison Hot Springs, where the attendees could drive to their local uh, dedicated parking and then take a shuttle shuttle bus from there. Uh, the last item is the public and stakeholder consultation. Uh, this was completed in two phases. The first phase was intended to collect feedback uh, about known known issues and ideas that they uh, that the public wanted us to take a take a look at. Some of the key findings that we found was that the boat launch parking supply lot was not sufficient to meet the demand. Uh, some of the tourist parking demand was known to spill into the local residential areas. Uh, the private parking demand from private developments in the waterfront was also known to spill into the municipal supply. Uh, the four hour maximum parking spaces were well received and that a residential parking permit program was, was desired. Phase two was conducted in November. The intent was to present the preliminary study findings and collect feedback, which will be used to finalize the study findings along with the comments that we may receive here, here today. Uh, some of the findings that we that we received was that there's concern over the, similar to the first one, concern over the private parking demand spilling into the municipal system. Uh, the boat launch and special parking in remote, remote locations is not anticipated to improve operations. Everyone would ideally want to park immediately adjacent to the event. Uh, the boat launch lot on the, the boat launch is commonly used by, by non-boat launch users. Uh, some hotels currently already off offer public parking, indicating that shared parking is already informally occurring and that uh, new developments should be providing EV charging stations, which we did confirm is already part of the Harrison Hot Springs uh, zoning bylaws. The next steps is to take the feedback that we hear today uh, from the village and from the public and incorporate them into the study findings. And then we'll be finalizing the parking master plan report and we'll be back here in January to discuss the, the finalized recommendations. Uh, that's everything we had for today. I just want to, at this point, thank everyone for, for listening and I'll uh, open the floor up for, for any questions that you may have. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hoover, you want to kick this off? Yes, good evening. Uh, just a little bit of a background is that I have investigated your company. Um, you've done a lot of work back in the UK where I come from, especially in the municipals I've worked at and some of the others. And very good reports on you. The only thing I've got with uh, two main points with this report is one, it tends to be a more... Uh, uh, um, a metropolitan area rather than um, an urban area like us um, of probably looking at a population of 100,000 to actually get this working with the transportation and the parking areas and the use of spaces. But the one question I want to ask most of all is that by increasing our parking outside the waterfront area it will also increase the uh, um, the value of land because developers will now be able to increase the density on these properties as there'll be now, there are no restrictions on the parking because the parking will be outside. Um, I've got some concerns with that, but it, most of my concerns I can't put to you at the moment until I see the final report because there's economic, graphical, logistics, and health and safety uh, are all included in this. Plus, I've just read a report on the hidden climate cost of America's free parking spaces. Um, so 
So thank you for a very good report and so you're a very good company, but I need to see the final report before I can actually make any decisions. Thank you. Yes. Palmer. Um, the question when we, the bullet talking about increased areas of paid parking, talking about uh, Lillooet, I think from St. Alice to Spruce. Um, now I take it that that issue would be based on being able to do that because presently uh, everything from Harrison Hot Springs Road down to Spruce is provincial highway. So I don't believe we have the authority to, I'm pretty sure we don't have the authority to make paid parking out of it, but I, but that will be relevant from Hot Springs Road through to, through to Spruce. I, I just wanted to, to kind of raise that issue. Is, is that based on the fact that we're going to be able to convince the provincial government to uh, allow us to do that? Because at present, I don't think we're able to do that <coughs> from Hot Springs Road to, to St. Alice. I'm sorry, Hot Springs Road to Spruce Street. you have an answer for that, uh, Harold? Yes, yes, I do. I, I believe, um, are, are you referring to Lillooet Avenue? Uh, we do note that it, that is under the jurisdiction of the ministry and that uh, the coordination would be required with the ministry to implement pay parking. Uh, it is an extra step uh, that would be re that would be required, but uh, we don't foresee any reason as to why it uh, why it wouldn't be. I, I know in, in other jurisdictions, uh, pay parking has been implemented along streets that are owned by the the uh, the, the higher tier municipalities. Councillor, that's uh, I may have another in a moment, but I'm I'm fine for this moment. <coughs> Piper. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I do have concerns about uh, pay parking along a provincial highway, as my understanding is it's not permitted. So I'd be interested in learning which, pardon me, which municipalities um, do um, work in coordination with the province uh, uh, to allow that. My other concern is the uh, residential parking permit. I would like to um, hear from the consultant for similar communities um, in size of Harrison Hot Springs, how that works uh, for staff and um, the issuance and um, coverage of parking permits. Do you have any examples? Mr. Hodel? Yes, uh, the, the intent would be to, there's, there's different ways of, of approaching how to facilitate these, these parking permits. Uh, common ones is hang tags, you can go electronic, uh, although that requires some, some expensive technology. So for Harrison Hot Springs, the, the best approach could be the, the simple tried and tested, tested um, hang tags, where the, they would be distributed to the residents living along the affected streets, and then they could uh, display those on, on their vehicles. Uh, we would recommend that they be tied to the the license plates that they're of, of the owners that way they couldn't be transferred between the between users or sold uh, this by the way is, is going to be outlined in the report that um, that will be uh, distributed uh, shortly we're still putting the finishing touches on that uh, but uh, but yeah the hang, hang tags is what we'd be would be recommending does sorry does that answer the question i'm curious if you through you, Your Worship, uh, to the consultant. I'm curious if you have any um, insight into the time it takes to manage that. I guess it depends on the size of the residential area that would be affected, um, but I'm just wondering about staff time and maintenance and um, monitoring of, the, of that system. Right, we, we do include, sorry. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the, we do include staff um, hour estimates along with cost estimates in, in the report for each of the recommendations, including the residential parking permits. And uh, to answer your question about where it, uh, we're, we're recommending the, the permits be implemented, it's, it's essentially north of uh, the, the Miami River. Uh, and a little bit to the, to the south of it, um, it's, yeah, a little bit to the south of it, um, near the, the tourism Harrison building. 
if, if that's if you're able to follow my uh, my uh, my directions off the top of my head. The, the report does include a map as well, so you'll be able to take a look at it there. Would there be a map included in the final um, report that indicated the affected streets? Definitely, it will be included. Thank you. That's all, Your Worship. Thank you, Councillor Vital. Thank you, Your Worship, through you. Um, thank you for the preliminary report. I do have uh, a couple of questions. I want to go back to the residential parking permit system more more for clarification for myself you indicated that it would be for residents who live close to the waterfront area and i'm wondering what your justification is in not including that in the whole of the village um i happen to live right on the border between Harrison and and Kent. And I'm wondering how you came to that recommendation only for in the waterfront area. Thank you. That's a, that's a good question. And uh, the answer to that is that the, the residential per parking permit uh, recommendation goes hand in hand with the parking restrictions. So we're, we're recommending that uh, short term parking, so three to four hour, uh, maximum parking being implemented on the residential streets close to the waterfront. And the intent here is to prevent the visitor parking demand from spilling into the residential areas, which is one of the objectives of the study. And then to allow the residents who are living on those streets where we're implementing those three to four hour uh, maximum parking time limit to continue parking as they do today, we're recommending that the, the parking permits be distributed to them. And that those permits would grant them exemptions to this new maximum parking time limit so that they can continue parking as, as they do today. We wouldn't be implementing parking restrictions throughout the entire village, uh, only the streets closest to the waterfront that are in danger of that, uh, the visitor parking demand spillover. Thank you, I, I appreciate that, that clarification, go ahead. No, that's, that's, that's everything. So I just wanted to add that the residential parking permits wouldn't be needed in the areas where we're not recommending the, the restrictions. Thank you. Um, and I have one other question regarding the, the boat launch parking um, area. Um, it's kind of known that uh, residents who own properties um, that are boat access only, um, specifically in Kent, um, will park boat trailers for an extended period of time um, at our boat launch um, and then causing quite a large reduction in overturn of parking stalls for day users or uh, people who come out for the day, launch the boat and park their trailer uh, and then do pull their boat out. Um, at the end of the day. I'm wondering if you looked into that and how you see perhaps that could be addressed. Thank you. That's a, that's, that's a good question. And, it's, and uh, the turnover of the, the boat launch parking uh, supply is, is, is not something that we had looked at. We, we can consider that if that's uh, something to be desired. Uh, we could implement a, a maximum uh, similar to the residential streets for, for general vehicles, there's a 48 hour maximum on street limit. So we could implement something similar to, to prevent those, those longer term uh, park, parking users and to encourage a higher turnover and therefore serve more users. That's definitely something that we could, we could consider if there's the, the desire or the appetite from, from the village and, and city or village council. Um, thank you. I, I would um, strongly urge you to, to take a look at that. Thank you. Nothing further, Your Worship. Councilor Piper. Thank you, Your Worship. I'm wondering if the consultant could back up to the page that um, talked about EV stations and expanding our system, please. I'm wondering, um, I'm not seeing any numbers. Is there some target that we should be um, trying to achieve 
each year or in the next, say, five to 10 years for new installs? Right. Uh, so the, the answer to that question is, uh, so the, the BC uh, targets 10% EV sales by 2025 and 30% by 2030. And we're recommending that the, the village target those same percentages for the adoption uh, when it comes to the, the municipal parking supply. We, we give the exact numbers in, in the report itself. Uh, I don't have those off the, the top of my, my head. Uh, how much they are. Uh, that, so those, those are the recommended targets. Uh, that being said, we, as Janice noted, um, there, we are recommending that the village uh, complete uh, semi-regular parking supply and demand surveys to monitor demand. Uh, EV would, would be, uh, so EV demand would also be monitored. And as the existing spaces are found to be well utilized, uh, that, was, that could trigger the, the desire to implement some uh, more. Uh, so we do have the targets or the planning targets, but uh, we do recommend monitoring and installing as, as needed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, um, obviously, any parking permits would have to be issued by the, the village. Are you considering different zones? I mean, obviously, the people nearer to the waterfront will have the prime uh, parking areas. Are we, uh, what I'm trying to say is, will you allow people, say, from <laughs> a person to actually come down and park within these zones, which obviously was going to cause uh, um, friction? So are you, uh, have you considered dividing the, the village up into zones so people can park in their own zone? And if they want to park down the front, going to uh, pay at the meter? Um, also, we have a thing about household uh, uh, visitors, household visitors. I mean, obviously, if all the areas are taken down by the, near the waterfront, uh, anyone visiting is going to have a problem. W would you consider, uh, um, like, day passes to be issued by the village that maybe the, uh, um, the householder could purchase two or three of these to accommodate their visitors and the uh, um, district nurses and the rest of it. Thank you. Thank you, Last one, uh, Councillor Palmy. I don't more question you said. Sorry, I think I saw earlier uh, the issue of moving an access parking spot from the corner of Eagle and Lillooet to Spruce. I, I think that was <clears throat> What I had seen earlier in the presentation is—is is that correct? I don't have a relocate. It's right that, there. That is. <clears throat> so my question is, that would seem to be trading a spot. I, I kind of was hoping that one of the things that would result from the parking master plan is a significant increase in the number of accessible spots that we uh, that we offer. So I was kind of surprised that it would just we move one, as opposed to just creating several more considering that we are you know a retirement community and we attract retired people uh with uh, uh, so that, that that's the one comment i had i just uh, i was surprised that we would that it would be based on relocating as opposed to just adding uh more uh, accessible spots thank you yes and i do have a response if you don't mind uh, the, the intent with uh, or the logic behind relocating the accessible parking space was based on our parking supply and demand surveys. We had isolated the different types of parking spaces, including accessible parking, and, and we found that the, the existing accessible parking spaces uh, had a peak utilization of 53%, so only a little over half of the parking spaces were occupied at um, during during the peak hour, which which indicates to, to us that the existing supply is, is more than sufficient to meet the, the demand. And that's why we recommended relocating one of the spaces uh, instead of adding new spaces. Uh, I do want to note that the the one that we're recommending to relocate, uh, the one from Lillooet and Eagle, that one was was, I believe, Janice, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, 
there I don't think that was ever ever used during during the two survey days that we had uh, we had conducted. So we recommend relocating to that one to Randall Park, which is where uh, additional accessible spaces were requested through the consultation. Okay, Councillor Hooper. Yeah, final question. Uh, um, have you looked at shared use bays? I mean, we've got a number of loading bays down on the Esplanade that are empty most of the time. I mean, they could be used as share use with the uh, disabilities. Um, like loading from 8 till 10.30 and then disabled after that. Is this something you'd be also be looking at? Thank you. Mr. Hurdle. Yes, yes, we we do look at uh, shared shared parking, and that is one of the the short term recommendations that we included. Uh, so we we had touched on shared parking agreements with private waterfront establishments, uh, but if those loading spaces are not being used during certain parts of the day, then they can definitely be. Uh, temporarily rededicated to alternative land uses during the, the off hours. That is actually something that, uh, that we recommended uh, for a different study as well, where we found that the, the loading spaces were, that were being provided were, were heavily underutilized. Uh, so that could definitely be included as well uh, for, for Harrison Hot Springs. And obviously these bays would have time plates on uh, for yeah. the uh, loading and then for the Disability the blue badges. Thank you. Thank you. I just uh, oh can't, last one, Council Vital. Thank you. You were so good at it in time. Um, I'm wondering if uh, any uh, you looked at or any consideration in regarding our current overflow parking lot um, that is often utilized during some pretty peak times during our tourist season. Um, and if you came forward with any public input or, or any recommendation on, on the use of that area. Thank you. Mr. Hurdle? The, the overflow, yes, thank you. Uh, the, the overflow parking lot was was stated to be to be planned to look at it during the next official plan update, uh, and then that's the the extent to uh, what we were permitted to to comment. Where we included the notes in the report saying that it's sometimes used during special events, but the plan is to you know, look at during the next official plan update, and we'll, a, a desired use will be decided uh, then. All right, thank you. Nothing further, Your Worship. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you very much for your presentation, both of you coming out this evening. I found a very, uh, very good report. Um, I will say I've been personally involved in parking in Harrison since 1993, long before we could get paid parking. Eventually we got it in. But uh, I know you're looking to the future here, and we all have to look to the future for the excessive amount of uh, tourists that we're going to get here. But um, at the moment, as we know as council and most of the public our our high 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 times are normally long weekends and weekends in the village where it really doesn't um cause too much concern but i noticed that miami river drive walnut and poplar street were not on that list of um for parking you've jumped all the way to pine for the yeah, one yeah, side yeah, street the other two streets are surround the village empty lot and the village office. That's Walnut, where the school is, Poplar Street, which is a very, uh, uh, no no homes there at all, and Miami River Drive. Oh, yes. Uh, sorry, I, I do want to clarify. Uh, so are you talking about this, this map over here? I can't see too so we, much. Uh, sorry, the, so I, I can confirm that the the study itself accounted for the 
for the entire Harrison Hot Springs Village, so all on street parking. Uh, the, the maps that we included in the presentation focus on the, the waterfront area because that's where uh, we observe the, the highest parking demand. Uh, that being said, the report itself uh, will include the, the entire village of Hot, Harrison Hot Springs uh, parking system, so all, all streets, all the way down to McPherson. Okay, because then you'll have to give a serious consideration to when you're referring to uh, like Schooner Place and Alder and Pine in regards to the, um, for parking on that. McCombs is different. Um, also, um, being involved with this for many years, uh, unless you get a, a, um, a change at the legislature, uh, they do not allow uh, parking on, on the highways. We tried this. Uh, apparently they did it many years ago at UBC and it was uh it didn't work out very good it was it became a problem and the highways would prefer to do if it came through would prefer to do their own parking and their own revenue and everything else so that's why that never happened on Lillouette instead they put in the angle parking reverse angle which gave us more spaces but again thank you very much for your presentation and we look forward to your next one in january thank you Thank you. Order of business, please. The next order of business is our second delegation this evening. It's Gretchen Tardif from Up and Up Consulting, and she's here to uh, speak to us about the upcoming village website redesign. Good evening, Gretchen. It's all yours. Good evening. Uh, I'm joined by Elaine, who is going to be presenting. Um, Elaine, do you want to share your screen? Awesome. Okay. Um, so we are, uh, we're happy to be here. Thank you for having us. And uh, we're just going to do a quick introduction of our project. Uh, we'll do a summary of the public engagement that's been included with the new website project. And then Elaine is going to walk us through uh, the new Harrison Hot Springs website preview, and we'll have some time for questions at the end. Uh, so just a quick little bit about Up and Up. Um, so we were established in 2012. Our purpose is to make life easier for people through better online experiences and access to information. And we specialize in user experience uh, projects, building websites and providing full service marketing and communication services to our clients. So we've built about 300 websites, 40 of them for municipal clients uh, such as yourselves, and we've won quite a few awards along the way. So we're quite, uh, quite proud of what we've achieved so far. <clears throat> And then to just quickly walk through this project. So we're running a four phase project. As you can see in green, we're currently in what we call the beta phase. Uh, so beta is uh, the point of the project in which the website is uh, it's done with development. The content has been added, but we're not quite ready to launch yet. So it's kind of like we're putting the finishing touches on it and making sure that everything is ready to go. Uh, so our process started with the selection and then update of a template site to reflect Harrison Hot Springs branding. We went through a public consultation process back in October to hear from uh, people in the community about what they wanted to see in the new website. Then we migrated all of your existing content into the Drupal CMS. Drupal is what your new website is built on. Um, and then we installed and set up that template. Beta delivery and training is what's happening this week. And then we're planning on launching the new website January 12th of next year, which is right around the corner. So we're excited about that. Um, so we'll go over some features of your new site and then Elaine will actually show you these in action. So the new site is accessibility compliant. It meets WCAG 2.1 standards, and that's sort of the gold standard of accessibility that's industry recognized. Uh, your new site will be mobile responsive, meaning that it'll look the same on a variety of devices. So all of the same information will be available to people, whether they're on a desktop computer, a tablet, or a mobile device. 
we've got a prominent search function included. Uh, we've got the ability to schedule content, which makes it really easy for your content editors to send things out. We've got a web form module, a document and media library. There's a translation tool that provides translation services across many languages. Uh, and then we also have subscription services that allow push out of uh, newsletters and alerts to people who are subscribed to receive communications from uh, the village. And then there's also the opportunity to integrate with additional third party software. So our public consultation process ran for two weeks in October. Uh, we received 16 responses. 80% of people who participated live in the village and the additional 20% either work or own a business. And we provided a summary report and uh, some recommendations for future engagement opportunities that the village can look at um, as sort of a phase two to this project. The public consultation process uh, it identified several features that are important in the new website. So for the home page, those would be uh, prominent social media links, a rotating banner, quick links, and the ability to have events and council meetings. Uh, on the inside pages, the important features identified were a newsletter subscription, page-related notices and alerts, uh, images and visuals, and related links and contact information. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Elaine, and she's going to actually walk us through the new site. Great. Thank you, Gretchen. <laughs> Sorry about that. All right. So this is the beta site. I'm going to slowly scroll through it, and then I will talk about some of those features Gretchen mentioned in the slideshow. All right, so Gretchen mentioned that the website is mobile responsive. What this means is if, um, if the web page is scaled in and out, all of the information will stack in space accordingly until it gets to mobile. So it is mobile friendly, not losing any information and everything is still legible. I'll make it bigger for viewing. So at the top is an example of an alert. So you'll have the ability to post several alerts at a time. Um, that includes a date, alert level. So there is low, medium, and high. It also includes um, description text, a link to read more. Um, and here's an example of a low. So you'll see here it's indicated. And then once the user is done viewing the alert, they will hit the X to collapse it. And then the, the alert will live in the header. The alert will stay there until it is removed on the back end of the website. To the left, to the right, we have a link to contact us, a search, and the menu. Um, I will show you the menu and the search show slowly. I'm just going to go down the page and then we'll zoom back up to that. So underneath we have the rotating banner that includes up to three features. Um, here we're just showing two. So to view another one, you'll simply click the dot here. And text with a, uh, an image will appear that um, accompany the, the article. On the right is um, links to popular resources. So these are links to highly visited pages. All of the colors and fonts have been considered and appropriately selected to comply for accessibility standards. So when the user hovers over, there's a subtle movement and color change with the link becoming underlined. This lets the user know what is clickable and again complies with accessibility standards. Underneath the text controls, um, the user will be able to edit their, their visual experience and adjust the text sizing. So you'll see the text is getting larger or smaller depending on what is appropriate for them. Underneath, we have notices. This is paired with an image, descriptive link, and date. Um, you'll notice the hover state as well, using the Harrison Hot Springs um, brand colors, and then being a high contrast to comply with accessibility standards. 
So the user can click a single article to view it, or they can view, uh, view the full archive with the title here. Um, as well as the images in the back end, they include some alt text for accessibility. So with the screen reader, they will read out the description of the image. So for this one here, the alt text would say image, a woman walking through puddle to let them know and describe what that image is. Underneath, we have a section for council meetings styled similarly for, as above. It includes a descriptive link, same hover state, date, and a link to the full archive. Below, we have important dates. This uses the same um, image, descriptive link, and date as the notices, but now it is into four columns, so four images. As well, it includes an enlarged date in the top left corner. Um, these colors, again, um, were uh, carefully selected to comply for accessibility, making sure that contrast is high enough. In the footer, we have a link to subscribe to updates that Gresham had mentioned, contact information, a social media link, and a language selector here. Going back to the top, we will view the menu. So when the user selects it, it will expose the menu. This is a mobile first approach, meaning that it will look the same on your phone as it will on desktop. And I can show you what that looks like as well. So scaling it down to mobile, making it very intuitive for the user. Um, as well as it includes some first level items and then additional popular links. Again, similar to that um, popular resources we see on the homepage, just offering the user more resources to highly visited pages. For the menu, the user will simply click the plus, acting as an accordion to expose child pages, and they can further drill down and expose um, third level items. And these are paired with this green line here to add some hierarchy and some separation. You'll notice as I've been clicking through, there's this um, a dashed line. What this is called is a focus state, and it is, um, it's a best practice for accessibility. It just lets the user tab through to know their location of where they are on the website. So we will select Memorial Hall and press enter. Um, this is an example of an inside page. I will slowly scroll through. Similar to the home page, there's a banner image paired with this, this swoosh and the Harrison Hot Springs texture. Underneath the page title is breadcrumbs. This lets the user know what path they took to get to the page they're on, and this acts as a mini navigation. Underneath, we have some body copy with an image, and then some accordions with collapsible uh, resources and information regarding the page. On the right hand side, we've got those text controls again, but in addition to the user will have the ability to print or share. Underneath that piece, we have a side navigation. So similar to the menu that we've seen, um, this is just a section navigation. Again, letting the user just navigate through the website and find additional pages that they might need to access. Below is a tile for links and documents. So this is optional. The user will be able to access links or PDFs that relate to the inside page or, or highly visited um, documents and links. Um, for the search here, we will click in and the user can search by keyword. Press enter. Search results will appear and the user can also filter by, uh, by type. So they can filter and hit enter and then just narrow their search. And finally, we have an example of a form. So here the user will be able to click in, enter their information. For date, they can click in and select a date to autofill and then hit submit and send the form. All right. So I, th I think we're, that was the end of my presentation. So open to um, some questions now. 
I'll just quickly okay. jump in um, and, and go over our next steps uh, before we take mm -hmm. questions. Um, so we are in the beta phase of the project. So right now we're asking the village staff to test this beta site and to document any bugs or issues, um, any adjustments that they would like made before we launch the website. So we'll be taking that feedback this week, making adjustments <clears throat> over the holiday period and then getting ready to launch. We'll be seeking launch approval on January the 5th. Uh, so that's it for us for um, our presentation. And yeah, we'll take some questions now if you have any for us. Thank you, Councillor Piper. Thank you, Worship. I don't have uh, any questions, just a comment and a uh, word of thank you for the great work. I'm completely ecstatic to see uh, this modern version of our website. I know we've been limping along as best as we can. So this is really, uh, really exciting, and it's going to be great for everybody to be able to navigate easily through the site. It's very intuitive, and it looks fantastic. So I am thrilled after at least a seven-year wait for this. So thank you so much. Dr. Palmer. Yeah, it does seem impressive. So um, I quite often go to the site trying to find bylaws. So if I pushed village bylaws, what do I have to do? Say if I just wanted um, zoning, can I just do what I just push village bylaws and if I put in zoning, it would it would work with the search engine or? Sure. So uh, Elaine, do you want to actually go to the village bylaws page for us? Um, it's uh, one of the popular resources on the, on the home page. Yeah, there you go. We'll do a live demo for you. So right now, this is linking away to your civic web. Um, so this is not a change from how things are working currently. Uh, civic web documents will not actually be pulled into the dynamic search within the website because it's considered a, a separate URL. Uh, we are in the process of working uh, with your team to determine the best way to bring these documents into Drupal and into the website. So I believe the intention is going forward that these documents will be accessible within the site um, and then they will show up in search. So yes, your question of, of you know, could you filter by bylaw, we can absolutely configure review that would allow you to do that down the road. We're just not there um, yet. So that would be a phase two of this project. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Councillor Hooper. Uh, no questions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Vive. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you for the presentation. And uh, I echo Councillor Piper's uh, comments and um, I'm, I'm quite impressed <laughs> and um, we certainly have uh, waited a long time um, to look at uh, up, upgrading our website. So thank you very much. I just have one question. Um, often our um, regular and special council meetings um, are recorded and currently they are available on our existing website, uh, often within a couple of days. Um, and uh, feedback I've gotten from residents is they very much appreciate that um, because um, of their inability to uh, attend in person. So I'm just wondering where they would appear on, on the new website. Sure, so um, Elaine, do you wanna to go to the mayor and council page for us? Uh, it's one of the popular resources as well, or you can find it through village. I think it's, yeah. Uh, mayor and council? Uh, why don't you try village office? Sure. And try the agendas, minutes, and videos page. So everything can be uploaded to this page. Um, you're able to uh, to update a link. So I don't know where, you, you, where you're currently hosting um, your videos, but you can easily update a link on this page uh, as a, a, a something that's capable or that, that we can do within Drupal. It would be, again, an add-on to this project is we could build a separate content type that would allow you to actually upload the videos to Drupal and then display them um, in a view. So it would be similar to how um, you know, kind of search works where you can filter. So you would you would go to a page and you would see a list of all the videos and there would be uh, the opportunity to search based on a tagged system. So that's something that doesn't exist within this 
website currently, but it's something that we can very easily build uh, for you in the future if that's something that you would like to consider. Um, all right, thank you. Thank you very much. The CIO has a comment. Yes, Your Worship, through you to Councillor Vidal. And just to reassure Councillor Vidal and all of Council that uh, the recorded versions of the Council meetings will continue to be available on our YouTube channel. They're not currently actually available on our website and the, it wasn't part of the scope of this project to um, build the type of technology that the consultant's referring to, but uh, there'll be no interruption of that particular service. So the people that are used to seeing them on the YouTube channel in a timely manner can still uh, enjoy that access and you know cast them to their big screen TV. Thank you. Um, that's that. That's for you, Shireen. Thank you. No other questions. Well, thank you, ladies, for your presentation. It's much appreciated. Excellent presentation. We look forward to the new year when um, the next uh, round comes on this. And um, take care and stay safe. Thank you. Thanks very much, and thanks for your complimentary feedback. We'll definitely share that with our team. Thank you. And the next order of business, please. Yes, Your Worship. The next order of business is correspondence. We have one letter for receipt. It is a letter dated November 2nd, 2021 from Jennifer Todd, uh, requesting um, consideration of the establishment of a permanent washroom facility at Spring Park. Do we have a mover and a second? A move by Councillor Pipe, a second by Councillor Vidal. Any, this, oh, this is just for receipt. It's just for receipt, first. Your Worship. Okay. This is for receipt, not for the business part. I just wanted to offer my support for this as what the Age Friendly Committee did when they were formed. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, Your Worship. Um, we can uh, we'll get you we, on the next, the next one. Yes, okay. we don't require a motion for that. So moving on to the next item, which is business arising from the correspondence. Call um, the question all in favor of receipt. Opposed? Anybody? Right. No. Thank you. Now the next one, please. Uh, the next order of business, then, of course, is business arising from the correspondence. I would like uh, any comment of Council Vidal. Yeah, thank you, Your Worship. I, uh, I do thank Ms. Todd for um, the letter and, and uh, bringing her concern and request forward to Council. I do believe that um, this is valid uh, as our community does continue to grow and see more young families uh, utilizing Spring Park. Um, and therefore, I, I do think this does merit uh, con consideration. So um, therefore, if it's appropriate, I would like to uh, introduce a motion to have staff research the feasibility, location, and costing. Uh, of a more permanent washroom facility in Spring Park and bring that report back to council at a later date. Thank you. Um, I, I'm in complete agreement. I'd like, I'd like to thank Ms. Todd for her uh, well-articulated letter. And, um, but in regards to the motion, um, I'd like some amendment to um, have a report back, of course, from staff, but to um, provide us options on different types of permanent and all weather uh, washroom facilities, including a uh, brand name Portland Blue. And I'd also like to end off on Councillor Vital's. Um, uh, um, motion that um, costing be brought back on a timely matter in order for con consideration during um, budget time. So I don't know how you want to word that, but. <laughs> yeah. Would you like me to read it back? Um, the motion is that uh, the letter be referred back to staff who are to come forward with the report concerning costing, feasibility, and location uh, of such a facility with options for an all-weather facility, including an option for the brand name Portland Lou. This report to be brought back for consideration within the 2022 budget. I like it. <clears throat> 
Sorry, Mr. Allen. Uh, I am also in favour of um, of something happening in the um, in regards to more of a permanent washroom there because the porta potties are okay, but that's not the answer really. When there's a uh, that's the, our really main uh, park in the village, especially for the children and families to go to. So um, I agree with the mover and the amendment, Mr. Councillor Palmer. Yeah, I'm I'm in favour of it as well. It's subject to what its cost is. Um, I, I, I think it's, I think it would be an important, uh, depending on what the facility is, but I think that's important. Obviously the porta potty is not the best choice. Um, and so I think that's good. I mean, I mean, one of the issues that I would also, and I know this, I'm just trying to not trying to widen things out, but I have for quite a while believed that there should be one or two covered picnic areas in that park, uh, as well. Uh, especially when we had COVID and there was no place for people to gather in the community inside because we shut everything down. Uh, and in terms of people just being able to sit out and have a game of cards or something uh, and have a big, uh, have a birthday party for kids, like most parks in the lower mainland have a couple of covered, you know, canopied areas. And I think that that park would really benefit with that, not just the washroom. Now, I know we're talking about the washroom now, but I, I, I wouldn't mind looking at it at some point, looking at additional facilities in terms of how Springs Park can be improved because it is, I think, fairly to say it's the main park for residents in our community. Um, I don't think a lot of the residents are going down or they're obviously along the beach, but I think that's where people take their kids. And so, you know, a, a, a nice covered assembly area and that. So just wanted to, to, to make that point. I don't know how I'm ever gonna get that forward. So that's why I thought I'd at least mention that. Washroom good, if it's reasonably affordable, but also a covered area or a couple of covered areas would be helpful too. Okay, no more discussion on the um, on the recommendation from Councillor Weidel and the amendment from Councillor Piper. Call the question. All in favour? Opposed? Anybody? Sorry, I just want a point of clarification. Is uh, Councillor Palmer adding no the structures to that, or you're just no, no. spewing? Okay, thanks. Sorry, did you call the question? Did everybody get an opportunity to vote? Uh, the, yes, uh, I did call the question. We did vote and, and then I allowed Councillor Pipe to have another question Council there. So that's fine. Uh, I'm sorry, Councillor. All in favor. Thank you. And for business, please. At the next order of business, your worship is reports from councillors, committees, committee of the whole and commissions. And we have Councillor Hooper. Good evening, all. I'll try and be quick, it's time to get in on. The 3rd and 10th of November, I took part in a webinar by the uh, Alzheimer's Society of BC. 3rd, 10th, 12th, 17th and 1st of December, I attended a Zoom meeting and training with the CNIB. 9th of November, I attended the Agassiz Harrison Historical Society meeting. 10th, and 17th of uh, November, I attended Zoom meetings with the Terramac Institute. On November the, uh, um, oh, sorry. On December the 10th, I took part in, again, the Alzheimer's uh, meeting. Uh, 12th of November, I attended the Zoom meeting with the CRN on the Christmas holiday increase of abuse. On the 19th of November, I attended a Zoom meeting with Fraser Health. On the 24th and 1st of December, I attended a Zoom meeting from the BC Lung Foundation. And over the last week, I have also paid visits to some of the households within the village that were flooded or were nearly flooded. Thank you. Again, related strictly to my area's uh, list, uh, I attended the uh, November meeting of the Fraser Valley Regional Library Board. Uh, the uh, Kent Harrison Joint Emergency did not have a meeting, although I think they, there's one scheduled in the next couple of days. And uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Piper. 
Thank you, Worship. Um, I can't begin my report uh, without taking a moment to thank our village staff mm -hmm. for their deep dedication to this community, their extensive hard work, and each and every one of them um, doing their best um, and doing their task to keep us safe. And um, it could have been a lot worse than um, that what we what we did face uh, over the last uh, couple of weeks. So I just wanted to start off uh, with my deep appreciation to each and every one of them. Uh, November was uh, a very busy month, but um, as it relates to my portfolio on November 2nd, as part of my role with the Citizen Advisory Committee with Mountain Institution, I was provided an opportunity to attend a webinar on victims of Canadian federal offenders meeting needs and improving supports. There were four speakers from across Canada that discussed the services available to victims, how victims can register to receive information about offenders and the gaps and barriers to accessing services and information. It was an absolute excellent and very raw uh, presentation. The week of November 14th and 220th was the National uh, Victims and Survivors Crime Week. And the goal is to raise awareness nationwide about the issues facing victims and survivors of crime, the services and programs and laws in place to help them and their families and the important work of victim service providers and other criminal justice professionals who assist victims of crime. On November 5th, I had the honor to meet with Mr. Derek Hansen, the recovery advisor with Stolo Community Futures and Community Futures North Fraser. He's a wealth of information and I encourage uh, local businesses uh, to reach out and um, speak with Mr. Hansen. November 9th, I attended virtually again the Harrison Eggsy Chamber of Commerce meeting. November 15th to the 17th, I attended Civics. This year's moderators and presenters were absolutely excellent. And on November 18th, the AGM um, and regular, I attended the AGM and regular meeting of uh, Harrison Eggsy Chamber of Commerce. That's the end of my report. Thank you. The Councillor, Councillor Vaughan. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, November 15th to 17th, uh, I also attended uh, the annual virtual civics forum, which was hosted by the Lower Mainland Local Government Association and Civic Info BC. Um, this year's theme was inclusive local government, building equity and embracing diversity. Uh, there is a broad recognition that our governments, our institutions, and our citizens have not always lived up to these principles. Um, and so the speakers focused on how and why we must continue to do better. On November 18th, I attended the Agassiz Harrison Healthy Communities meeting, and I'm really pleased to report um, that our two communities still maintain the highest vaccination rate within the Fraser Health region. And also on November 18th, I attended a Lower Mainland Local Government Association Executive Board meeting. Um, and that's the end of my report, Your Mayor. Thank you. Next order of business, please. The next order of business is reports from the mayor. Thank you. First of all, as uh, many other communities in, the, in, in British Columbia and the Fraser Valley gone through a tremendous, terrible time with these atmospheric storms, that hit us three times and our hearts and prayers go out to the folks at, uh, in the Abbotsford area and of course um, Hope and, um, and Mission areas, Hatsik, all eight, all eight electoral areas of the Fraser Valley Regional District was effect, affected by this, um, by this terrible storm that came through and I have to, um, as a director, I have to uh, compliment the staff at the EOC in Chilliwack under Jennifer Kinnaman, who done an outstanding job of keeping things moving. And of course, uh, our chair, Jason Lum, who did an excellent job 
of being there all the time, both for the city and for the regional district. Uh, so, um, uh, for those who may have had, if there was some flooding, I, I mean, I've um, due respects to this council. I've lived here when we've had a few floods here. But when I lived on Naismith, my sump pump was going every minute when we had floods like that with half of the Miami in my, in my backyard. So it's nothing that I haven't faced before. But if you don't have a sump pump and you live below the floodplain, then that you, you, you're you gonna be in trouble. Um, there were certain comments that came out on social media regarding, also I noticed that Mayor Peter Rob from Hope brought this up on the newscast as well which really was uncalled for by people who put out comments that really alleviates the grief for a lot of residents who don't need that. The, 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 our floodgates operated as per they should be, our, our pumps operated as they should be, and within four days, the level of the, the flooding in Spring Park was gone. And it saved, it saved the village. And I have to compliment like um, the other councillors I'm sure would like to, Councillor Piper just did, that we had three, three people operating our wastewater treatment plant night and day to make sure that that kept going. That was my sleepless nights was our wastewater treatment plant. I wasn't really concerned about nothing else because when I get people on, what they call them trolls or people that put stuff on Facebook, they were gonna flood within six days or six hours, whatever. I never take much notice of that. So I, I've been through these situations before. And we even had the army here one year when we got to a really bad stage. So um, those people who put out this grief on social media should be ashamed of themselves and put people already grieving with COVID under this uncertain, this uncertain height, which is not, uh, not needed at all. Uh, the trail to the Whippoorwill Point and our wastewater treatment plant, as you probably know, if you haven't, it is closed till further notice. Um, received a card from our minister, Josie Osborne, Dear Leo, wishing you and your council and your hardworking staff all the very best for 2022. Have a wonderful Christmas. And also, when we're talking about staff, it's not just the people that operated the wastewater treatment plant, it's the rest of the crew out there who weren't always fully staffed. And of course, all the calls and the extra work that our staff in the office had to take to relieve people's minds that we had, we, we more or less had, had everything under control compared to the rest of the lower mainland. We were in no way affected, and even no way affected like Rockwell Drive was for those poor people there. And I believe the order has been rescinded there now. Um, on your behalf, as you probably know, I wrote a letter with concerns on behalf of our business community to um, the Honorable Ravi Kaloon. I'm advocating for financial assistance from the province to help prevent job loss and ensure that our businesses sector is positioned to welcome visitors back to our beautiful province when it's safe to do so. And this wasn't to do because you were flooded. This was to do with financial assistance. And those people who may or may, who may have been affected by some localized flooding, they can also apply to the disaster relief fund. That's all out there on social media. And then there was also a, um, a news release that went out on behalf of council uh, regarding the relentless storms by serious atmospheric river events that began November the 14th. And again, thanking all our utilities crew who have worked around the clock over the last two weeks. Um, the wastewater treatment plant and flood pumps remain fully operational throughout these extraordinary storms. You may find the videos on your on YouTube channel for these facilities interesting. 
uh, throughout these storms. Our curbside pickup never stopped and garbage that still kept going. Our village council staff are grateful to your understanding and support during these trying times. At the um, Fraser Health Rural meeting on November, basically there was a discussion on the um, cooling centers, um, facilities in Hope with the Golden Age Group, Agassiz Friendship House, Agassiz Housing Society, Clubhouse, School District 78, there's mutual agreements that, that can be used. The Ag Hall was rented in the summer for two days and they had no attendees. 16 hours to set up that took and many volunteers were involved. Um, search and rescue, rescue and fire departments, District of Kent, no guarantee of facilities and volunteers using. They could be called out on duty calls. There was comments regarding getting volunteers to man these um, calling places and the, um, the um, search and rescue and fire departments were asked, but of course they, they could be called out at any times. Um, concerns of course of seniors who will not share calling centers with other vulnerable population. That was another concern. Only five to 12 people use a calling center in Hope. District Hope does not own any facilities for calling centers. Hope shelters have only six beds, more concerned with the winter than they were with the heat. Um, and they, um, they did, did give out a lot of supplies uh, for those that, that uh, needed it. Um, there was a suggestion that EMBC play a larger role in these um, cooling centers in regarding to maybe fitting them out with, um, with the necessary equipment to make them cool. Um, and this will be forwarded to them. The um, Fraser Health Rural Calling Centers conversation noted the funding does not cover operational costs. Discussion regarding responsibility, scope, and mandate of local governments, for example, rural and incorporated communities. Like I just said, the calling center in Agassiz over Ju July 3rd and 31st had no attendees. Under the regional uh, district. They themselves have come on with a, a new online engagement site as well as of August of this year. Um, full recruitment is in full swing like many employers in the region. We have a number of openings to fill. Um, the IT team successfully completed a major upgrade of phone system hardware and network program at the main office. Bylaw enforcement teams open 350 new bylaw files and conducted 76 inspections this qu that quarter. Building inspection teams issued 82 building permits worth over 12.4 million in construction value and conducted 523 inspections this quarter. Uh, the emergency management, the alertable system provides emergency alerts and notices to electoral air residents more than 6,000 people have signed up for the system so far. Uh, the response to the interface fire on Long Island, House and Lake Area C declared a state of local emergency. And the issue, as we all know, was ordered out there. The um, regional services, 121 dogs were impounded between July 1st, September 30th. These 29% were licensed. Animal control officers attended 830 calls for service this quarter and conducted an additional 148 park patrols. There were no new dangerous dogs impounded in the third quarter. The hearing for a dangerous dog impound in January has been postponed to January 2022, and the case for a destruction order will be heard. 
with smoke from home heating contributes about 27% of PM 2.5 emissions in BC to encourage residents to upgrade a cleaner burning appliance. The FBI DS still offers rebates as part of its wood stove program. Volunteer fire departments attended 360 calls this quarter, 136 of these calls were for fires, 144 for medical, 59 motor vehicle, and 13 alarm, two hazmat, six mutually. Outdoor recreation planning, and use the hot summer led to extremely busy season for the parks team as they work dilig diligently to water hundreds of trees and shrubs. Um, a new 165 meter gravel trail was built in Nielsen Regional Park to connect the parking lot to the lower, to the picnic area. And the, um, the long anticipated Friday Express expansion to Burnaby received provincial funding and will now proceed. That's that. I attended the, um, the smaller service for the Remembrance Day at the Sanitar in Agassiz who represent the village. This is just a little bit of history, which I thought I received and I thought it might be of, of interest. Uh, obituary for Margaret Dorothy, Dorothy Robertson, 25th of December, 1927 to the 18th November, 2021. The matriarch of our family was born in Vancouver, December the 25th, passed away peacefully surrounded by family. And after a long, courageous, stubborn battle against several health issues, passed away at the Rotary Hospice, and I believe this was the last of the of the Kilby family that um, had just passed away. So it might be of some interest to some folks. Um, the FBID Jason Lum retains the chair, and Patricia Ross, vice chair, hospital board Terry Raymond. Stays as the chair and Sylvia Pranger as vice, as vice chair. Uh, we all know about the flooding. I won't get on to that. Um, Hope Hospital and home generators were when power when power was was off. The Hope Hospital does have a generator. A team from Surrey was flown in specially to take care of a young boy eventually was sent to Children's Hospital. Um, oxygen was getting very short and surgeries were counseled, uh, brought, eventually brought in doctors, nurses and pharmacists flown in. Some staff um, traumatized by the road closures and are not returning. Uh, due to road closures, local staff off duty at the Chilliwack General Hospital flown in by helicopter and they were transporting patients from Chilliwack to to Abbotsford by helicopter and and Valley Haven which has a hundred people were down to two staff on duty to the due to the road closures so um and of course Rockwell Drive and we know there was 170 homes affected by this by by the by the slide there um Justin, when we talk about people helping people here, you may have not known that Agassiz Ready Mix delivered sand and everything else when they didn't have a driver. They found one here for us. Uh, volunteers helped with the sandbagging. Uh, those who donated food to evacuees in, our, in Agassiz, village staff and crew didn't have already done that. People helping people. The state of the pumps, I've already commented on that. And the um, Metro Vancouver mayors sent us a letter if we needed any support during the, the tremendous rainfall, and we thank them for that. On the 18th of November, we had a conference call with our minister, Josie Osborne, uh, Fleming from the highways and, and Minister Farn Farnsworth regarding the um, the people in the areas east of Agassiz to Hope and the commercial vehicles stay single lanes. And that's all what's really has happened that we know about. Um, at the RACS meeting, 
at the regional district. Uh, we had a presentation from Win Wild Safe BC regarding to the black bear populations. 219, there were 400 calls. 221, there were 120 calls. The biggest um, deterrent, of course, is for people leaving garbage out um, and more education is required. Uh, dogs off leech in these parks and that, which people say, why not let them off leech, do are a concern to attract the bears. Um, most reflective comments that uh, regional growth strategy, they've done the same as with our Have Your Say Harrison. They've done a um, questionnaire for the future regional growth for the area. And um, there's one other thing that's of concern, I think, to the village, and it's here. That we get, we get, I'm assuming many requests, I'm assuming we do for memorial benches at the village office during the course of the, the, the year. But a good thing has happened here now that the Earlier this year, the FERD board adopted the memorial program policy detailing guidelines for requesting, purchasing, installing and maintaining memorial items. This policy was in created in response to an increase in public requests for memorial items and the creation of a wait list. And um, so people who may not get a bench in Harrison, can request through the regional district, not through the village office, can can request to go into their programs, much the same as ours, 10 year program, with all the same type of um, uh, for, um, costs are similar, but uh, there is another alternative for those who wish to, um, and I did ask if, the, if uh, East Sector Park was a, a location, they said yes, it'd be all their parks that people could request a, um, an alternative if there's a long waiting list in Harrison for a memorial bench. And that, thank you very much for being patient, is the end of my report. Next order of business, please. Yes, Your Worship. The next order of business is item 12, reports from staff. And the first report is the report of the planning consultant dated November 25th, 2021, regarding the official community plan review consultation strategy. And I believe our uh, planner, Ken Cossey, is here with us this evening to present it. Hi, Ken. Good evening, Your Worship. Good evening, Council. Everybody see me okay and hear me? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, this evening, as the CAO has mentioned, we're going to be talking about the official community plan review, the consultation strategy. But prior to that, we're also going to have a, a a review of the building awareness report, and then we'll we'll move into the outlining of the official community plan consulta consultation strategy. Uh, thank you very much for putting that up, Rhonda. So what we will have in front of us is just the building awareness report, and we'll go to the next slide, please. And so this evening, what we're going to talk about in this report is the purpose of the report, the review process where we're at to date, and some of the topics that we've reviewed and some of the information that we've collected so far to date. Next slide, please. Excuse me. This report is a blend of both technical information collected about the village and a summary of the results from the first community survey. So it's a blending of the two reports together, and this is why we're calling it just building awareness. Next slide, please. This is just quickly where the review process is. You can see it started back in May 2021, and there's all the tasks that have been accomplished. We're currently at the part in December 2021. Uh, we'll be looking at the development of the consultation program, who to consult, and how do we collect community input, and we'll be implementing the consultation program and a review of the background report. And you can see that the rest of the tasks there are identified in front of us, which includes some of the communications issues that we'll be talking about a little bit later on. 
Uh, yes, it is a quite a tight schedule, but I've cleared up my end of the schedule. Usually I look to do three to five projects in a year. This time around, I'm only going to be doing one and two so that we can reach the deadline as outlined on the, uh, the review process. Next slide, please. So just for uh, ease, We've broken it into, there's four phases associated with your update report. The first one is the awareness building. The second one is to review the new, the, the new concepts. Uh, third is to design a new plan. And the fourth is the adoption phase. And currently right now, we're just finishing up the phase one where we're informing, educating, and collecting the required background technical information. Next slide, please. So the technical review, the topics that we looked at included the parks and recreation issues, the transportation issues, municipal services issues, discussion on the population and the growth. We looked at the housing issues, and we looked at your environmental issues, and we looked at some of the land use issues at, very, at a very broad, higher up level. And next slide, please. One of the first things that we did is you'll uh, we have to get an, an idea of the type of population that we're planning through. And you can see that in 2016, your base population based upon the uh, census or Stats Canada, the census profile, you had a base population in 2016 of 1465. So from there, we can do some projections forward. And those projections are, are shown on pages uh, eight and nine of the report that's in front of you. And they're just projections by, by that. I mean, they're an educated guess because what we've had to look at is the age specific fertility rates, the age specific death rates. We looked at the in out migration rates and we looked at the housing vacancies. So all we can really do is just project forward based upon the, the best known uh, uh, factors that, that we can uh, try to analyze. It's, it's not a hard and fast science by any stretch of the imagination, and it's not meant to be, uh, it's going to be specifically this many people. It could be more, it could be less, but based upon the projections that we have at this point in time, this is the, the focus that we're going to be looking on for the target ranges. And some of, and what I like to do is you, you've noticed on page eight, nine of the report in front of you is you get the age cohort analysis. I like to break it out that way so everybody can see how many five-year-old males, five-year-old uh, females, how many are 70 to 74, all of that, because there's all of these types of information is applicable for municipal work. And <clears throat> overall right now, the, your current breakdown of 2016, your age group uh, of, of zero to 14 is almost 10% of your population. 15 to 64, they're 55% of your population with the average age of 52.4. And it's well, for a population of 65 plus, it's 34.8%. So now what we can do is because we've got that type of information, as we're moving forward, we can see if there's any changes in the demographic shift of, of your population base, because we've got that information as a baseline today. And uh, no surprise, your major employment by industry is your accommodation and food ser services sector, which is 115 or approximately 18.7% of your, of your workforce. And you can see the, the workforce breakdown by industry on page 10 of the report in front of you. Next slide, please. Then we also looked at the municipal services. And by that, we looked at all the storm drainage system, and we saw that there's approximately 10.3 kilometers of pipes ranging in width from 200 to 900 millimeters. Your sanitary sewer system, total system length is 12.5 kilometers. The forest main is 3.5 kilometers, and your width ranges for both systems are from 150 to 350 millimeters. And for your water lines, total length of your system is 15.5 kilometers and your width range is 50 meters to 350 meters, or millimeters, sorry, <laughs> meters, be quite large. Uh, next slide, please. You've also got associated with this, you got 75 public fire hydrants and 14 private. 
and the largest number of the private are found on the Harrison Hot Springs Resort and Spa land. And associated with this as well is you've got uh, local roads. Your road network system is controlled both by the village and the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure. That, that's more on, on the, uh, the major road. The local roads, you have 8.06 kilometers. Your collector roads like McPherson, McCombs Drive and Eagle, that's 3.71 kilometers. And your arterial roads like Hot Springs Road is 4.7 uh, kilometers in length. Next slide, please. With a review of your parks and recreation, you have, as you're all aware, you have seven community parks. And what we've done in here is we've noted all of the uh, following types of assets that are associated with each of the parks. It could be everything, or it can be just um, nothing, unfortunately, or uh, a combination thereof of these various issues. And as I mentioned, you've got uh, seven uh, community parks, and the, all that information is, is outlined for you in, your re in the report in front of you, ranging from pages 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19. And then also associated with that, you've got some, next slide please, is you have the recreation site located in the East Sector lands, and you have a variety of trails in or adjacent to the village, and you've also got a uh, provincial park in close proximity to Harrison Hot Springs. <coughs> Uh, next slide, please. Give you your transportation system. As we're all aware, the Agassiz Harrison Connector, or also known as Route 11, services uh, Harrison Hot Springs. Approximately 25% of the village's workforce lives and works in Harrison Hot Springs. The balance travel elsewhere, less than 15 minutes, is the highest average, followed by a, a 30 to 44 minute commute. And here's the breakdown that you have based on information from Statistics Canada on how people are commuting uh, in and out of your, your, your village. You can see that the car, truck, or van with the driver is the largest, 300, 370. As a passenger in a car, truck, or van, it's 15. Public transit is zero. People who are walking is 95. The bicycle is 20. And other methods is 10. Next slide, please. So looking at your housing, what we've done is we've combined the 2016 census profile and the village's housing report that was completed in 2019. And looking at the housing report, it's indicated there's approximately 928 dwelling units located in the village with approximately 720 that are owner occupied, approximately 162 that are rental households and 46 that are not occupied at all at this particular point in time. And it, According to information from Stats Canada, most of the houses were built between 1991 and 2000 with almost 300 homes, followed by 1961 to 1980 with 155 homes. And as you can see the information there, that's the uh, number of dwelling units that Statistics Canada data has indicated. You get 515 single family dwellings, other attached dwellings, 200, semi-detached, 10, rural, 45, apartment flat in a duplex, 20, apartment less than five stories, 130, and movable dwellings as five. Uh, the next page, please, or next slide, please. Now, from an environmental perspective, you're part of the Georgia Depression Eco Province and the, and the Fraser uh, Lowland Eco Section, which just gives you some site-specific information, tells you a little bit more on the, on the environment that uh, Harrison is, is growing through. And this includes your subsurface information or your, your types of soil units. Uh, the soil units help the user to understand the drainage capabilities or if the type of development can be uh, supported by that soil unit. You have 21 soil units. The map is shown on page 26, all of the different 20, uh, the 21 units. And the surface drainage is either classified as very poorly drained or poorly drained. And the soil, the majority of it has been deposited here by uh, fluvial methods. And the protection and enhancement of the natural environment is achieved right now through land use planning regulations, landscaping guidelines, and the use of public education. 
Next slide, please. And your land uses, which are identified on page 27 and 28 of the report, you currently you have the following main land uses that are designated in your official community plan. You have commercial, residential, resource, and public use. And with your commercial, you can see that you've got four other subcategories that are broken down into marine tourism commercial, waterfront commercial, village center, and tourist commercial. And then your residential, you have three other subcategories, your lakeshore residential, your low density residential, and your medium density residential. And as well, you've also got a small section of agricultural land reserve, land that is dedicated, that is uh, subject to provincial uh, legislation. And this is in the East Sector uh, Crown Land area that's been identified on your, on your zoning bylaw map. And as well in 2019, uh, Harrison was designated a fire smart community. So because of this, we should start looking at developing a new development permit area because the idea of a, a fire smart designation helps. You've got to start looking at trying to prevent the fires from going out into the forest or coming from the forest into the community. And we can do that by setting up a development permit area uh, as we go through the process. Can, uh, next slide, please. Now we had the first uh, community survey that was done pre-pandemic. It was done through SurveyMonkey and the, the, the community survey information is on pages 28 to 30. Um, please note that the community engagement process started before the village adopted the get into harrison.ca uh, uh, platform through the bang the table. And currently on through that platform alone, you've got over 400 uh, users. And the survey will be repeated on the Get Into Harrison engagement site uh, in the new year. Next slide, please. But there were some rather interesting results from the survey. Uh, there was 56 responses, and out of that, 66 of the respondents were age 55 plus. 46 of the respondents have lived in for less than five years in Harrison Hot Springs. And approximately 87% require the village to continue protecting the views of the lake and the surrounding mountains and to protect and maintain the air and water quality and the village's biodiversity. Also part of the, the questions that we asked, as you can see in, in the report, was what are some of the things that you're not comfortable with as a goal anymore? And out of that, approximately 60% of the 37 responses have indicated that the village should not provide a mixture of housing types for all incomes and ages. And we, on, that is, is going to be a, a little bit of a concern because the legislation requires us, the provincial legislation requires us to, to look at those, that exact issue. And uh, next slide, please. So now that we've finished all off with our technical review, the collecting of the, of the, the information and everything else, we performed a gap analysis where we compared the current official community plan to the various sections of the local government on what is the required content of an official community plan or basically the section 473 requirements. You can see all of that, that analysis is on pages 31 to 32 of the report. And what we did is we broke it off into the topics at the, the top that says the Local Government Act requirement. And then we listed all of the issues and I've deliberately done them the small font so because the big thing, the thing that I'm trying to draw your attention to is the large, the categories that we, we've done. And then the second thing we look at, does the current OCP address this requirement? Yes, no, it started, but not completed. Uh, what was done? So your know, policies have been developed for this section or that section, and if required, what type of follow-up is now needed for the new official community plan. So we're starting to see that we're starting to give some direction as to what we need to be looking at with respect to the new updated official community plan. And one of the things that we can start looking at, for example, is sec the section 484 requirements or the development approval information, which is a big, long, convoluted term that it just means impact analysis. And it can be included inside, inside of your official community plan. All we have to do is designate uh, how and when we want that to take place. And then the second component of that is we create a development approval information bylaw so that when we say that we want an engineer out, they've got to have X number of years of experience. They got to do this, 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 and this. 
And all of that information is provided as part of the development application package. And it's provided by the developer at no cost to, to the village. The village can say yes or no to that information, uh, or we can ask for clarification on anything like that. And um, we can also ask the developer if, if, for example, there may be some mitigation issues. What are you going to do to mitigate those issues, uh, Mr. or Mrs. Developer? And they can put that in the report as well. And that all becomes uh, and, or, uh, uh, information that goes out to the public through the public hearing process, and uh, people get to comment on it. it it's, quite a, it's quite a useful tool, um, but that's something we can look at as, as we're moving through the process. Um, the next slide, please. <clears throat> so again, with part of the, the gap analysis, we also looked at some of the Section 488 development permit tools and the type of development permit tool that may be created and does the current uh, OCP create this type of development permit? And you can see there that this is what the, your current uh, official community plan does. You can see at the very bottom with the promotion of greenhouse gas reduction, policies have been created and targets have been set. But one of the things that we have to start looking at now is setting up a greenhouse gas uh, development permit area so that we can know uh, how we're going to meet the, the greenhouse gas uh, targets that have been set in, in the current bylaw. And one of the other things that we'd be looking at, you can see it's halfway up, is the protection of development from hazardous conditions. Well, you have geotech uh, development permit areas right now. And one of the other things that we were suggesting that be added is the fire smart uh, or wildfire development permit area. As we were mentioning earlier about the fire smart um, concept. Next slide, please. Some of the other things associated with your, your gap analysis is your community amenity contributions. Way back in 2018, under policy 1.26, we uh, created a policy dealing with community amenity contributions. Uh, for a continuation of this transparency, it is suggested as a guideline from the ministry that they put a section into the uh, new uh, official community plan so that everybody's aware of this and that it doesn't come as, as a surprise. And that just uh, becomes, as, as we go through this process, um, the, the developers may voluntarily wanna contribute X number or whatever the situation is uh, towards uh, with, with their application package. But we have to be really, really careful here because this is where Whistler got uh, um, beat up through the court system because they, they basically uh, were starting to use their community amenity contributions concept as a weapon to be used if you want your rezoning application, which is what you cannot do by any stretch of the imagination because it's strictly a voluntary contribution that the developer may or may not want to uh, implement. And then the final section your worship is on page 34, and that was all of the information sources that we've utilized for the creation of this, uh, the first report, the background report, phase one awareness building. And thank you very much for this slide. We're done with the slide presentation. Hello? Does that complete your presentation, Ken? Yes, it does. And were you going to briefly uh, present your report to council? Yes. You, you don't need a motion, Madeline, do you? Uh, when, uh, uh, Ken's going to present his report and then we would entertain the motion that's in okay. the agenda here. Okay, carry on, Ken. Thank you, Your Worship. So as we're all aware, we're, I'm back to the report, page 13. An official community plan is a comprehensive policy document designed to guide the physical, environmental, economic, social, and cultural development of the village. The OCP should showcase the municipality, encourage investors to invest, visitors to visit, and non-residents to relocate. The vision and the goals of the OCP must be set up in such a manner that the success of the vision and the goals can be measured at some point in the future to see if the OCP is achieving its goals. 
While there are many definitions on what consultation is as outlined in the model below, the better approach is to set up a system that involves and engages the participants. Please note that the direction of the arrow is the information flow. So you can have informing where we can go out and say, this is what it's gonna be. Uh, and you've been informed, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Public, or that we can then ask them questions and they can involve us through the process, but that's not really to any type of engagement. So what we need is a, is a process where the community is engaged, the members of the community, other governments and various stakeholders are engaged with us as, as we move through the process. So the overall engagement strategy, realizing that COVID-19 experience, we have devised a, a preliminary engagement strategy option that considers opportunities for both face-to-face -face and online engagement programming. We suggest utilizing, utilizing a combination of engagement techniques to educate and engage and excite the citizens of Harrison Hot Springs. And this includes the use of your village, your website, advertising, in-person pop-up events, displays, online surveys, workshops, and the use of workbooks. Consultation is an important factor in the development of the OCP and council must provide one or more opportunities for consultation as per sections 475 and 476 of the Local Government Act. And this is outside of the public hearing process. In addition to the above suggested consultation strategy, input should be provided from the following agencies or governments through the following processes. Uh, write a letter and the suggestion for a follow-up stakeholder meeting and presentation, if required, that would be to the uh, Tourism Harrison River Valley, the Harrison Agassiz Chamber of Commerce, a, le a letter and suggestion for follow-up government to government meetings and presentations at key points throughout the process. That's with the Stahelis First Nation. And this would include a presentation on what an official community plan is and the sharing of the village's building awareness report. The first draft of the OCP will be shared with Stahelis Nation and the planning consultant will make a presentation to the council and answer any questions and then sending letters only to the Agricultural Land Commission, the District of Kent, the Fraser Ca Cascade School District, the Fraser Valley Regional District, Fraser Health, Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure, Harrison Hot Springs Fire Department, the RCMP, and then doing a presentation to the Advisory Planning Commission as directed by council um, as and when required. And please note, you can add or delete to this list as council requires. And with that, your worship, staff is recommending that council adopt the above reference OCP consultation plan and that council authorize the release of the building awareness report. And we have a recommendation moved by Councillor Piper, second by Councillor Vidal. Discussion? Councillor Palmer? The, obviously, we want the maximum amount of consultation. Um, the only area where, I, well, there's many little areas, but um, the letter and suggestion <coughs> for stakeholder meetings. And I, I'm just wondering, we've got two identified stakeholder meetings. One is the Tourism Harrison, <coughs> sorry, River Valley. And the second is the Harrison Agassi Chamber of Commerce. That seems to me to be somewhat limited. Um, for instance, if the concept of going to the Agassiz Harrison Chamber of Commerce is to get business input, um, I'm not an expert on the local Chamber of Commerce, but I bet that they do not represent the majority of the Harrison businesses, and I bet the majority of their members are actually Agassiz businesses. So it just, uh, I don't have a problem with those two stakeholders being consulted or, or, or offering them <coughs> the opportunity for feedback. It just seems to me that that's not an adequate way to get feedback from the local business community. So I'm, I'm wondering if there's some way of, of getting some business community feedback uh, apart from them. Um, so that's not a part, uh, not instead of, but in addition to, I wanna be clear about that. And uh, I, I'm not, I'm trying to rack my mind to think of whether there's any specific resident groups that can be consulted um, because uh, you know, the concept of a stakeholder uh, has a different meaning to me than, than, than this would suggest. But uh, that, would, that would be the one area that I'd like to see um, 
some further in, uh, input from. Thank you. Before I give it to Councillor Hooper, uh, CAO, you have a comment? I just recall that earlier in the presentation, Ken, you were mentioning that you were going to reissue the survey that had originally been launched pre-pandemic. And I wonder if there might be an opportunity to circulate it specifically to businesses to um, more fully capture uh, that demographic. Oh, yes, 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 of course. And that's also, I was also under the advertising side of things where we, we can also specifically uh, uh, target it to any group that we see that is required, including any community group that comes along after we've thought about this for a while. And then this would definitely include all of the local businesses. If I can just jump in here, I think from what I can see in your report, Mr. Cossey, is that you've, you've allowed for a lot of more consultation to happen before this, this document moves forward. And so it, it's quite a there's quite a few areas that the public are going to have an opportunity to um, have their input into this overall. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. Councillor Hooper. Yes, good evening, Mr. Costley. Uh, just a couple of points. Uh, on page six of our document that we've got, you've got that the population of housing hot springs in 2016 was 1,242. Yeah, on the next page, page seven, it says total population 1,465. Is that just a typing oh, error? Yeah, that's a typo. My apologies. Yes, that is. Right. And also, uh, um, you've got the projected population. Uh, a we had a hunt on page eight, uh, 160 new residents. Uh, well, since 2016, we've built over 100 properties. So we're, we're less than one, we're less than two people per property. Yeah, see, this is what I was talking about with, it, with the, it's, it's, it's just an educated guess, uh, because right now, you, the, according to Stats Canada, there's 1.55 people per household. And at this point, I was using over uh, the 100 homes with a 50% build out for 2021, and then a 50 the 100% build up for 2026. And then you factor all that in. Yeah, and um, we have in the report that there's uh, seven parks. I'll make it nine. We've missed out the fire hall and the two park areas on Miami River Drive, Hot Springs Road. Uh, um, I think that needs to be adjusted. And the other questions I've got relate to the soil types. Now, on page 24, you've got like two and 19, brackets 70%. Is that 70% of that soil type in that area? Yes, it is. That is, that's cleared out for me. And... Uh, so I think the moment. Yeah, I mean, uh, um, and I was looking at the uh, definition of a gap an, uh, of a gap analysis, and it says the term gap refers to the space between where we are at the present and where we want to be a uh, target state. Um, now, looking at, on page 32 at the greenhouse emissions reduction for the village, there's no way that we're ever going to meet any realistic greenhouse reductions with the amount of vehicles coming in and out of Harrison. Is that correct? Uh, at this particular point in time, I can't speak speak to that issue at this, at this time. I, haven't do I don't have any research on it yet. Radio, thank you. That's all. Chair, you have some comments? Um, yes, I, I just wanted to um, say that it's a good point that um, we're only um, projecting 160 new residents when we know we've we've done you know uh, at least that in new units recently. But um, something that we bump in all uh, bump into all the time as staff is that we've got over 40 percent absentee property owners, so it always skews our uh, population statistics. So the 160 new resident um, projection may very well be close to accurate because uh, we can't 
we can't tell you right now how many units that are under construction or just in the purchase phase are being purchased by owner occupiers or absentee landowners. But if it follows the pattern, we're about 60% owner occupied. Any further questions, Councillor Vidal? Thank you, uh, Your Worship, through you to uh, Mr. Coffey. Not, uh, not a question, just more a comment. Thank you for the lengthy and very informative um, report and package. Um, I just wanted to uh, comment uh, on um, including Stahelis um, as in consultation. Um, I really believe that uh, this is a progressive uh, step forward. Stahelis is uh, our most direct neighbors and our friends. Um, so thank you for in, in including that in, in your report. Thank you, Your Worship. Any further questions? None from Council. Thank you, Ken. I really appreciate your, uh, your presentation. Like every, every document, whatever it may be, the numbers, statistics can change. Am I right? Oh, Nothing's yeah. perfect at first. You know, we have to, you have to rely on certain statistics from the government to base your comments and when you're making a report and then you have to, you know, um, bring it forward to, to, to the best of your ability. And of course, there's still more consultation to go on. This is just the start. Thanks again, Ken, and uh, stay safe. Thank you, you too. Next order of business, please. Uh, we should just call the question on the recommendation on the floor. Sorry, uh, all in favor? Opposed? Recommendation? Nobody opposed? The motion passes. Thanks. Thank you, Your Worship. The next order of business is still under staff reports. Item B, report from the financial officer regarding the 2021 audit plan. Ms. Jones, Pilon. Thank you, Your Worship. The 2021 audit plan Sage will run between November of 2021 and end of March of 2022. As part of our agreement with BDO Canada, our village auditors have provided an audit planning report for Mayor and Council. The report is presented for Council's information and is attached. Thank you. And this is just here for information, Your Worship. Just for information only. Yeah. Do you have any questions for Ms. Jones, Piron? No? Just here for information. Okay, thank you. Next order of business, please. The next order of business is a verbal report from myself, the Chief Administrative Officer, reporting out on a decision uh, made by Council earlier today in an in-camera meeting. And uh, that decision is as follows, that BA Blackwell and Associates Limited be awarded the contract to develop an urban forest master plan of a cost of up to 75,000 plus GST. And uh, council knows this, but just for the interest of the public, uh, that will be funded by the Canadian Community Building Fund, uh, formerly referred to as the gas tax. Thank you, the next order of business. The next order of business is a report from the Deputy Chief Administrative Officer, Corporate Officer dated October 26, 2021, which I will present in her absence. It's uh, a new draft of the council procedure bylaw. This is uh, council procedure bylaw number 1173 2021. And the recommendation here is that it be given first, second and third readings. But before we go ahead with those readings, I'd just like to call attention to um, uh, an administrative item within the, here it is, within the bylaw itself that uh, could be corrected for better clarity. And that is on item um, page 50 of your agenda. It's uh, item D A and it, it reads, it's a second paragraph from the bottom of page 50. It reads that except where notice of a special meeting is waived by unanimous vote of all council members under section 1274 of the community charter, at least 24 hours before a special meeting of the council, the corporate officer must give notice of the special meeting in accordance with section 1272 of the community charter, et cetera. The second comma 
which is one, two, three, four, on the fourth line of that of that um, paragraph should be deleted. So it says at least 24 hours before a special meeting of council. Delete that comma there if you would. We're going to take that out for the final draft of this bylaw. And that's uh, the only comment I have on this particular item, which has been before council before. It's been advertised publicly for comment. Um, and it is here for consideration for first, second, and third reading. We have a motion moved by Councillor Hooper, second by Councillor Vidal. Any discussion? Okay, call the question. All in favour? Motion passes. Thank you. Good business. Thank you. Uh, the next uh, uh, agenda item is number 14, new business. No new business. If there is none, the next order of business is item 15, questions from the public pertaining to agenda items only. Are there any questions from the public this evening pertaining to the agenda? Please step, oh, you're there. Should have known. Yes, Mr. Mayor, my name is John Allen. I reside at 398 Hot Springs Road. A couple of questions. Uh, like Mrs. Todd, who wrote about the porta potty in Spring Park, I'm a regular user of Spring Park. And I agree with her that the usage has increased with the, the picklers and the families turning up this summer. But my question is, why would you take out a perfectly good, useful and popular picnic table and put a porta potty right in the park when you have all kinds of space at the west end of Bear Avenue where we park our cars to put a porta potty? What happens currently is the honey wagon, the vacuum truck, on a Thursday morning drives right into the park and onto the grass in order to pump out the porta potty, which is both dangerous and ruins the grass. And there's no need for the porta potty to be actually in the park. It can be in the parking area that we use alongside the tennis courts without taking away park amenities. And furthermore, if you did want to make a toilet a permanent fixture of Spring Park, all you have to do is to put one up beside the sewer pump station beside the bus stop in the southeast corner of that parking area, where it would be out of the way. You can drain it straight into the sewer pump station. You have electricity there, you have water there, and you don't need to put any more structures in the park, perhaps, except perhaps Councillor Palmer's suggestion of some kind of a shelter. So what, why put a porta potty in the park when you have lots of space next door? The bicycle rack that you put in has never been used in my observation in three years. There's space there. We should use that instead of the park. So that was my question. Why put a porta potty in the park when there's space next door? Mr. Allen, the, the parking lot at the entrance to the park is very well used and by the people who use the tennis courts and to put a, a permanent washroom right on Eagle Street, just set back, I think is a ridiculous idea. So it will be going in the park in some locations. If it does come back to council with um, the costs, what it might, what it would cost and locations and all that. So that's coming back to council and council have made a resolution to send it to staff to come back with their recommendations. Thank you. My second question, Mr. Mayor, relates to the OCP. And the planner himself said that an important part of the OCP should be some mechanism by which to measure the effectiveness of the OCP to see how it's working. And that reminds me that you're missing one big step and I'm asking why you're missing a fundamental step in this process. And that fundamental step is to start and review how the current OCP has performed since its inception and what the shortcomings have been of that process and from that point you have a starting point to talk about a new OCP so why are you not doing a an objective performance review of how the current OCP has worked or not worked over the past perhaps 20 years as a starting point for this process why are you ignoring that fundamental step in starting this OCP revival or whatever you want to call it. Um, I thank you for your comment. It's already been passed by council to tonight's uh, 
but uh, as you very well know, the OCP is a living document and can be applied to at any time. It's not setting stone. And that uh, I'm sure that uh, Mr. Cossey has reviewed the present OCP. You may recall a few years back in your company, I did read out all the areas of the OCP that this village has carried out through their councils uh, under my watch and all the achievements that we've made. So quite a bit of the old OCP has been, has been covered. We're now looking at a new OCP and we're getting new public input. It's 13 years old, I think. So we're now getting new public input to, to see how, and, and at the moment, there's more consultation to come, as I said, and, I, and I'll and i leave it at that. Council have uh, already passed. Yes, Mr. Mayor, you do. It's not set in stone, but it does contain all the promises that the council makes to the community about the pattern of land development. And when those promises are broken, people get disappointed. Uh, it's not the matter Thank of you. broken, Mr. Allen. As you may recall as a developer yourself, there are many areas, both in Agassiz, Chilliwack, wherever you may go, you see these big boards up, have you seen them? Applying to the OCP or the zoning bylaw, and that's what they do. And, what, and then it's up to the council whether they wish to proceed with that or do not wish to proceed with that. Thank you very much. Anybody else this uh, evening? Mr. Mayor, like? Mr. Mayor, I am not, I'm I'm not a developer. I'm you finished. called me a developer. I am not a developer, oh, never okay. have been. You were a realtor, I'm sorry. Thank you. Yeah, realtor, same. Any other questions, please? No. Thank you everybody for coming.